Adam Gopnik has been delighting and energizing readers with his prose for over 20 years as a writer for The New Yorker and through his many books, including Through the Children's Gate, A Home in New York, and The Table Comes First, Family, France, and the Meaning of Food. This is actually his eighth appearance at Politics and Prose, which we're thrilled about. I personally first came to love his work with his best-selling Paris to the Moon, his memoir of living in France, which somehow manages the miraculous feat of being unbelievably glamorous and inclusive and very warm and humane all at the same time. His newest book, At the Stranger's Gate, Arrivals in New York, tackles another complicated and rich moment in his life, the heady, complex world of 1980s New York. Adam will be joined in conversation tonight by Ron Charles, the fiction editor of the Washington Post. Ron champions the real beating heart of the Washington literary scene, and we were so indebted to him for the work he does on behalf of DC readers and readers everywhere. Please help me give a warm welcome to Adam Gopnik and Ron Charles. Thank you. Ron, being the fiction editor of the Washington Post, you must get tweeted at a lot by the president, right? More I fiction, wish. right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just say, so ladies catching, it's a subtle joke, but take, take, takes a moment. Yeah, I've done a lot of superfluous things in my life, but sitting here helping Adam <laughs> tell stories to you is the most superfluous. Uh, I uh, got to stop working today and just spent the day reading your book, which is charming and funny, and I know you all enjoy it very much. Uh, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I was, I, yesterday, I was, the book just came out yesterday, and I did a radio interview. Do we have the book here? Yes. And the, um, the radio interviewer said, I just want to say, I've read a lot of books in my time, but your book, there's something about your book that's better than any book I've read. And I think, oh, this is great. The beginning, the middle, the ending or something. He said, it has the most beautiful spine of any book I've ever seen. <laughs> And it's true that it has a rather well-designed yeah, spine because it's, a, it's a, you know, a, a photo booth uh, strip that my wife, Martha, and I did shortly after our arrival in New York and sort of express of, you know, of idiot young couple, you know, delighted with themselves in the city. Um, but I thought, my God, if that's the only thing he can find to praise in the book, right? <laughs> the book sucks, but the spine is good. <laughs> Stick and it to was the spine. radio, right? It was radio. Yeah. He exactly couldn't even show it. It was something for the obituary there. <laughs> <laughs> In uh, your book, you say that uh, talking at the MoMA you made you realize the only thing I would ever be good at was spinning tales and telling stories. This is true. Not true, of course, but it is a funny line. And you once uh, told your wife, I lost my pants at the first morning in New York, and she asked back, have you looked in the park? That's right. <laughs> That's right. We were Canadians. Canadians <laughs> believe that everything is neatly organized <laughs> in the world. You know, my favorite Canadian joke is, how do you get 25 Canadians out of the pool? How? You say, would you please get out of the pool? <laughs> <laughs> And, that's, and that was one of the principles on which we tried to run our New York life. Yeah, th that's, it sounds, you know, like a joke, but... Um, you weren't wearing the pants. I was not wearing the pants. It was the worst thing that ever happened to me. Um, I was, uh, we had thought uh, that getting uh, one great suit would be a way to survive the indignities and, and horrors of our first year in, yeah. year in New York. And uh, we were that kind of young couple. We were in our early 20s, and we had a kind of Scott and Zelda fantasy about how even though we were living in the smallest apartment in New York, and I, you know, I, when I do a kind of show, a storytelling show that goes along with the book, that sounds awful. It sounds like a Kellogg's cereal you know, <laughs> bonus. But I tell some of the stories in the book on stage. And what I always do is I have somebody come up and we do, in blue masking tape, a 9 oh, by how, 11 rectangle. How big it was. Right. And I don't explain what I'm doing until I say, this space I lived in for three years with a woman. And it's, yeah, it's, it's about it's, this space. Yeah, it's exact. It's about the space between the front row and us Jeez. right now. And, the, um, and so we thought that we'd get through it by buying uh, one beautiful suit. We went to Barney's and I spent my scholarship money on the suit. And uh, I took it to the tailor, and he, to have the pants hemmed, being a rather short man, and I went back a week later and got it looked beautiful. It was a beautiful inky blue Ted Lapidus suit, and he, I tried it on, fit perfectly. He put it in a suit bag over a plastic hanger, and I threw it over my shoulder, and like Gene Kelly, I strode back to the apartment, and I zipped it up just to take one more look at this beautiful suit, and the pants were gone because there was no bottom to the suit bag and they had slipped off the hanger. Thank you for responding to that. <laughs> they, they had slipped off the hanger, 
and had fallen out somewhere along First Avenue. And I ran back out, but I never recovered them. And everything that we had planned was ruined at that, at that, <laughs> at that, at that moment. Um, it, our, you know, Ron and I have a friend in common, the wonderful novelist uh, Meg Wallitzer. That's who introduced us. <laughs> That's who introduced us. And who is my wife's oldest friend from when they were 15 years old at drama camp together. It, in, f in fact, I... Um, That's the camp she writes about. That is the camp she writes about. And Martha is the girl she writes uh -huh. about. And um, what's her name in the book? The uh, Interesting. The, in the Interesting. Wonderful yeah, novel. That read it, I'm sure some of you have read it. Um, Ash. That's Martha's name in The Interesting. Yes. Oh, yeah. And so she marries this incredibly ugly guy. Don't you remember that part of yes. it? And I said... And she makes... Oh, that part's not true. Um, <laughs> But they get married when they're kids. They yes. no, no. It's they move to New York and get married when they're when they're teenagers. Um, and uh, I said to and Meg always says that she's going to write a book called "Now You've Ruined Everything" because <laughs> she's sure that that'll be the moment in her life. And seriously, the the great um, uh, short story writer, Irish American short story writer Frank O'Connor, once said, "Every great story should have as its tacit, its invisible ending." and everything that happened to me after I never felt the same about again, which is actually the ending of one of his greatest stories, yes. a story called Guests of the Nation. But he said every story should have that as its implicit ending. Well, I want to ask you about storytelling, because when I read your book, and it's so funny, I'm thinking, gosh, so many funny things happened to him. But I don't know if that's it. I mean, funny things are happening to all of us. You just, you just notice them. Yeah. You're just better at telling it. Um, you, yes, I guess that's true. I do think funny things happen to all of us. That sounds so... All. I sound like a, a bad comedian on a 60s early morning show. Funny things happen to us. I sound like Alan <laughs> King, you know? Oh. Funny things happen to everybody. I just try and put... But it's true. Um, the, the one thing I think we all have in common is our sense of indignity, our experience of indignity. Yes. And this book is very much about all of the indignities that I experienced in the course of trying to make a life in New York. And I think that, uh, you know, one of the... And, and that's the truth. Failure is always more interesting than success, um, yes. inevitably. And this is a book about successive failures that nonetheless somehow added up to a life and a, and a vocation. And, that, and so I did, it's, you know, st when I said in the book, and I'm, I really do mean it, that storytelling is the one thing I do well, I don't mean necessarily yarn spinning, right, you know, that in that way, because obviously I write criticism, I've written books right. about Darwin and Lincoln and many other uh, more, uh, uh, dubiously highbrow subjects. But you have thought a lot about storytelling. I think about it all the time, right? And, and you perform for the moth. I do perform for the moth. How That's does that work? How do you take an event in your life and shape it for the moth? Because those stories are supposed to be true, right? They all are but true. they're also highly shaped. They're shaped and rehearsed. You know, it's the way well, you tell any stories. They're intentional. Well, the, the, it's like any story you tell. You know, for me, any story, and almost all the stories in this book, actually, are, have their origins in table talk. You know, I, you, you're sitting d around with friends and you're sort of swapping stories. What's the worst thing that happened to you yeah. when you first moved to New York, Washington, Paris or something? And everybody has a horror story, the size of their apartment. No, I had a smaller apartment than that, right? You lost your pants, I lost all my clothes and I was naked. On, you know, people tell stories that way. And you can see in the light in people's eyes whether the story works or not yes. in that way. I, I will give you a specific example that, that is in this book, and that, or in that book, um, that, uh, that illuminates, I think, the way it works in terms of the moth, right, yes. and telling stories. Um, the moth, by the way, is a storytelling group that has a radio program, if, if any of you have missed it. Um, it. I had the story about when I was a little bit more advanced in my life than at the beginning, when I lost the pants and we were living in this tiny room, and we actually had a a uh, loft in Soho, a small loft in Soho, that, and what we had really done was swap a cockroach-infested room for a rodent-infested loft. We had <laughs> mice and then rats, and the kind of the rats are the climax of the whole book. Um, it's, there's, it's sort of like if anyone ever were to adapt this book for a musical, it would be with a chorus of insects, and then the second act would be all rodents. Yeah. Um, they sort of are the Greek chorus of this book. Um, and so one night, uh, my... Uh, when my wife was asleep, I got a call from someone saying, uh, we're so looking forward to your keynote address tomorrow morning at the Pluralism and Individualism Conference at 8 a.m. And it was totally in character for me to have totally forgotten about having made a commitment to do such a thing. I'm a rather chaotic person, as my wife can tell you. Um, but instead of doing what an honorable person would do, which is to say, I'm so sorry, I've forgotten. And I said, yes, of course, let me get my book and make sure I have all the details right. Uh, now, what time was it again? You know, so I mean, said, 8 a.m., where? 
Doral Hotel on Lexington Avenue. And I went up and I improvised a lecture on pluralism and individualism, oh, which was like one of those Professor Irwin Corey <laughs> routines, if you, remember, if you remember him. You know, whenever we encounter the plural, we realize that it will atomize into the presence of the individual. And yet, how can we discuss the individual outside the organizing principle of the plural? We search for the plural and we find the individual. We look for the individual and we only find the plural. It was like a bad Barack Obama speech. Um, <laughs> how was it received? They loved it. Oh. So they, big hand, and they, and, uh, and the guy, the organizer said, as I left the conference, uh, he said, that was very healing. I, to this day, I don't know who these people were. They could have been Scientologists, <laughs> Moonies, something. And, they, and he did this beautiful thing that organizers do, as you know, which is to gently slip the check into your, yes. into your pocket, right? And you don't, I, could, I didn't remember making the deal, so I didn't know how much the check was for. I went out and the check was for a nice sum for us in those days, and we spent it, because we didn't have children yet or tuitions, we spent it on dinner, and then we came back to the loft a little sozzled from this very good dinner, and the loft was covered with mice. I mean, it was like one of those 30s cartoons, you know, where the little mice are playing bass violins, and, <laughs> and we had to leave the loft. We couldn't stay there, and we found ourselves back out on the street. So I thought that was a funny story, and I started telling it. And what was interesting about it, right, it got mild laughter tonight, is that when I would tell it <laughs> at the Moth on stage, right, at a big venue, nothing, nothing at all. And I realized that it's because the story I was telling what makes any story work is a certain, is the strange alchemy of I, right? You're telling a story about yourself. I did this and I did that. But it only works if there's an alchemical moment when it becomes a you for the people who are listening to it, right? Oh, I understand that. I recognize that. And that experience of, of faking your way through a keynote address is one that relatively few people are forced to experience, right? Right, fortunately. Right, and thank God. And mm -hmm. most people, you know, you have to have had that too. So when I thought about it a bit, I realized what was really funny and more universal in the story was that Martha, my wife, slept through the entire thing. She was sleeping when the phone rang, when they told me, they said, oh, will you be there? She was sleeping when I got dressed to leave the house. She was sleeping when I gave the, the lecture. When I came back from the lecture at nine in the morning, she was still sound asleep. I got back in bed, I s caught up on my sleep, and when she finally woke at 11, I said, you will not believe what happened <laughs> while you were asleep. <laughs> and you see, that's a much better story, yeah, that's, that's a much better much story, better story, story than yeah. the story about giving the keynote. Are you sure it happened? Totally okay. sure. Martha will, Martha's my way to sleep. Martha can sleep through anything. Martha pretty much slept through labor, if you can imagine, when she was giving birth. She kind of, she just is, she's a wonderful Icelandic girl who um, has to drink insanely strong coffee from the moment she wakes up until she goes to sleep at around midnight awake. just to stay awake, just to keep herself awake. <laughs> she is the Dormouse from Alice. And you've never life. taken this personally? Oh, I, of course I take it personally. <laughs> and in, in Meg's novel, you know, said, and she married a man so boring that she had nothing to do except <laughs> drink coffee to keep awake. Yeah. Despite losing your pants, your first job is at a fashion magazine. My first real job. Real yeah, job. My first you, yeah. Your so-so job, as you right. call it. Uh, how did that come about, and what was it like writing about fashion? You knew nothing about I fashion. I knew less than nothing about fashion. I, I was, you know, one of those uh, sort of jobs you get when you're starting out, and uh, friend, I got it through a friend at school who said they need someone to be the fashion copy editor part-time of GQ magazine. Now, GQ in those days was very much straight fashion magazine, um, largely edited and, and staffed by gay men, uh, and uh, for a largely gay audience at that moment. And... Um, uh, and they brought me in, and I knew nothing about clothing, and I knew nothing about fashion, but it was a job, it was a gig, and it was a good gig. So you I didn't tell them you knew nothing, of course. Of course you don't tell them. When, the, when, when you go in for the interview, the first thing you don't say is, I'm really ill-suited to the job that I'm interviewing for. Um, and they were sort of intrigued because I was getting my PhD in art history at that time, so I think they thought I'd add a little, little weight to the, to the thing. And I did it, and I loved it. I just loved it. Because I got to learn a shop talk. You know, and that's one of the real great pleasures. Of, of fashion. Of, fa of, everything, of everything. It's like when you start working at a newspaper, right? And people start saying, you know, we, we got to file the copy by, you know, by first deadline. And you sort of think, that's really cool, right? It's, it is. And so in this case, there's a whole language of fashion magazines that bleeds. And the spread either bleeds or it doesn't, which just means it goes across the gutter or 
reaches the spine or it doesn't. But I thought, wow, imagine that. It's, you know, the, the spread is bleeding across the gutter. I, you know, to be able to say that, and no one in the magazine business calls the magazine the magazine. They always call it a book. The book. The book. We're closing the book for September. I, I love that stuff. It's one of the basic rules of capitalism is that you are taught a shop talk. You're taught a talk so you won't think too much about the shop, right? <laughs> and, and, I, and I love that. The problem was is that I couldn't, I had no idea what I was writing about. <laughs> I had lost my suit pants. What did I know? And, but Martha was, is, was and is an extremely fashionable woman who was studying uh, uh, fashion design at Parsons at that point. So I had to kind of bring her into, con into contact with the images. So I smuggled them home from the kind of ass building to our tiny little basement room. And I said to her, what are th these clothes? And she said, well, these are beautiful linen shirts. And they have a certain kind of chiaroscuro. And I said to her, would you call it a very chic kind of chiaroscuro? And she said, absolutely. And so I wrote as the title for the whole section, chiaroscuro chic. And they loved it. <laughs> they thought it was genius. <laughs> It and was delicious. It was delicious. That's what the, my, the editor said. Oh, this is delicious. And on that basis, I got, uh, I got a job. They, they promoted me to the grooming editor. I became the ed editor of moisturizers and shampoos. <laughs> uh, I wasn't allowed to edit the, the cologne copy, you know, the, the, the scent, the, cl the what, men's cologne. You call it cologne. Uh, because for the pr they pretended it's because it was very sensitive. The truth is, is that that's a huge advertising category no. in men's magazines. And so negotiating how much space you're going to give to Calvin Klein or Ralph Lauren is done by the, the higher ups. But in any case, that, that was what, uh, that's what I did. There is, I think, a significant and, and not uh, trivial generational note to make about that. And is that, you know, just recently I was watching uh, Lena Dunham's Girls, right? Yes. Which I mentioned in, in, in the book. And Lena Dunham's character, Hannah, gets exactly that same job in the course of girls. But she's not so excited about it as you are. She's terrified. She feels that she will be trapped by that job. She will never escape it. And I do think that's a generational difference. We thought 30 years ago, we were ambitious and we thought, well, you get one foot on the ladder and the ladder will, will lead you upwards. I, I share an office at the New Yorker now with a wonderful younger writer named Alexandra Schwartz. And Alexandra said to me once when we were discussing this, and I said, you know, I'm struck by how kind of naively ambitious we were in our time. She said, yes, she said, we only want things to be adequate, <laughs> right? And I thought, ah, that's, that's so. You know, Why the, is that? Well, because the economy um, has, uh, not to be a Marxist about it, but I do think that, that it has an economic basis. When I was a kid, when you and I were young, that you could, uh, if you got that first job, right? It was actually a job. It might have been a ridiculous job, right. but it was a real job. The end of that story in the book of the chapter is Martha and I looked at each other and said, oh my God, we're gonna be able to stay in New York, right? Yes. And it was also a time when pre-internet, pre-digital uh, age, when, as I try and tell my kids, it, it's hard to imagine, but it was as though, if you can imagine there were 500 computers that could go online in New York. So if you got your fingers on one of those keyboards, you felt very privileged, right? Yes. Because that was the only way you could get yourself expressed at all. Forget short stories and, and long essays. Chiaroscuro chic you could only do if you were in uh, working for a magazine. There was no uh, uh, omnivorous, om omnipresent ether of words that engirdles us as it does now. Right. So I think all of those things have, have changed the, the, the tone. And how did you make it from there to the New Yorker, which seems like a big jump. It, it, well, not really. I mean, <laughs> um, I had been writing uh, for the New Yorker. I, I still it's make this joke, but it's true. That I've been writing for the New Yorker for 45 years. They've just only been aware of it for 30. Um, <laughs> and, and I did. I would write pieces for the New Yorker for what I imagined the New Yorker wanted for the old talk of the town and notes and comments section. And I would take them downtown to the old office on 43rd Street, and I would slip them under the door. And two weeks later, they would come bouncing back with a form rejection letter. And I just went on doing that yes. until eventually they bought a, a single piece of mine. And just out of pity, you think? Oh, totally out of pity and out of exhaustion. You know, they were spending a lot of money on postage, sending them back to <laughs> sending them back. You know, I think you, if you ask the question seriously, I, I will tell you another anecdote that, that is not in the book. Um, my kids love and is do we all Malcolm Gladwell? Who doesn't love Malcolm Gladwell, right? And we call him in our family, not that you're not dead, Malcolm, because whenever Malcolm comes for dinner, uh, 
the kids always say afterwards, you know, Malcolm is the best storyteller, not that you're not dead, or Malcolm always finds the one right um, anecdote, not that you don't, Dad. Um, <laughs> they adore him, as does the whole world. And my son, Luke, was reading uh, uh, one of Malcolm's books, Outliers, once, and he came into my office and said, do you believe in this uh, 10,000 hours thing oh, of Malcolm's, right? You know the, explain what that is. Right, Malcolm says, I think it's in Outliers, um, it's in one of his books, uh, that uh, <coughs> if you do something for 10,000 hours, you'll get good at it. The Beatles played in Hamburg for 10,000 hours, and they became the Beatles. That there's really no such thing as talent, there's 10,000 hours of work. Um, and, I s and so Luke said, do you buy this? And I said, well, you know, I love Malcolm like a brother, but maybe. And he's, we did the math quickly. He said, when did you really start writing serious? And I said, when I came to New York with your mother in the fall of it, 1980, and we lived, and he said, you've heard about the room, and you know, didn't want to hear about it again, but we did the math. And he said, your 10,000 hours were up, Dad, in May of 1986. And I laughed because that was when my first piece appeared in The New Yorker. Wow. So I called Malcolm and I said, you son of a bitch, how, could you, <laughs> how do you do this? And he said something that was so smart and illuminating. He said, it's just a, it's a parlor game because nobody thinks of hours in terms of years. 10,000 hours is six years. Oh. And any professional program you undertake will take six years, from the moment you walk into right. the halls of a medical school until they allow you to lay your hands alone on a patient is six years, from the beginning of law school till when you're practicing yourself. Every PhD I've ever known takes about yes. six years, right? So six years is the normal length of time for a professional program. So it takes six years, and I tell all of my, you know, I, I'm lucky enough to have sort of assistants, apprentices now, and I tell them all, it, if you devote yourself to this for six years, you will be successful in the end. Now, that you may not be Donna Tart, right? But you will find a place for yourself somewhere in the universe that you want to be in. You may become an agent, you may be a publisher, you may be an editor, but you will find a place for yourself. The catch with that is, right, that um, when we're our age, Ron, six years is like nothing, right? You could do you know, six years, I can't even remember what was happening six years ago. When you're 22, and somebody tells you it's a six-year program, it seems like yeah. for fucking effort, right? <laughs> and you say, oh my god, I gotta do this for six, six years? years? For six years? But it took me six years of seriously trying to, right. to, to crack it. I had never thought of the hours in terms of years. Which yeah, but that's what it right. is. Yes. That's what it is. So I had done my, I had done my 10,000 hours. And you've been at the New Yorker dur during some pretty tumultuous times. I have the been New there Yorker's life. I have been there for 32 years now. Yeah, so that's uh, from when Tina I was Brown. I mean, all Tina kinds Brown, of things. David Remnick, on. right? Fortunately, the last uh, last 20 years. I mean, now it seems very steady, but it was rocky we 20 went, years ago. We went through some. We went through some rocky times. I will tell you, and this may be, this may sound like I'm towing the company line, but I really, but I don't think I am. Uh, that the DNA of magazines or of any institution, yes. well, you know, from the Washington Post, yes. is extremely strong, and it's astounding in lots of ways how even very dramatic changes in ownership and editorship and so on, reduce the actual profile and content of the publication less than you think they might. Yes. I mean, if they shut it down, right. it changes it, right? Many did, of course. Right, yes, many did, right? But I if you're within the Washington Post, you're hyper-conscious of how much it changed, has changed, will right. be changing, and so on, too. But to the daily reader of the Washington Post, it sort of feels like the Washington Post, right? And I think that's been true, that's <laughs> true about, I hope, right? With some little little ascent, little ascent there. there. Yeah. So, the thing that makes the New Yorker distinct in all the world is that it's both the DNA of the New Yorker, the two kind of the double helix of the New Yorker, is that it's both a literary magazine and a weekly magazine, and those are two things that are very hard to reconcile: yes. being a weekly magazine and a literary magazine. And so, whatever form it took, it was always going to have a very peculiar and unique presence because of those those two facts. And it tends to reward people who are extremely industrious writers because it is a weekly magazine. Oh, and it also tends to uh, illuminate people who are good writers because it is a literary magazine. And out of that yeah. doubleness comes its essential profile, which has certainly changed a lot in the 30 plus years I've been there, but has changed perhaps less than you might think it would given right. how, right. how much change there's that been. Makes that makes sense, that makes sense. You write a lot <coughs> in the book about the art scene because you were an art critic, you still I are an art critic. You were watching at a very uh, significant time in the right. art world in the 80s there. Something happened. Something very significant happened in the art world in the 80s. Talk about that. Well, you know, the, I, was, I was an art uh, historian, a cadet art historian, and, and uh, getting my PhD in art history. And so I naturally sort of went into writing uh, art criticism. No one will believe this now, but I never really wanted to be the art critic of The New Yorker. I didn't. Uh, it, writing for The New Yorker was an escape from art 
it was not a it was not a, a way of doing it. But uh, I did I, you know art in the 1980s was famous for having gotten uh, guilt. You know it was a time when if you ask people about it, they'll say that money came into the art world and corrupted the art guilt world. Guilt spelled how? G I L T, Got and it. then the other one. I felt guilty about yes. celebrating that guilt. But what I think happened, and what I try and explain in the book, and it's a sort of long excursus in, in art history of a kind, is that um, the, 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 what happened is, is that the common um, uh, imagery that, that the younger artists began to draw on was, the, was media imagery. But it wasn't the media imagery of someone like Andy Warhol or Roy Lichtenstein, the comics and Brillo boxes and all of that. Right. It was B-movies and film noir. And that had become kind of the shared unconscious of an entire generation. So you look at David Sally's paintings. I don't know if you know them, or Julian Schnabel's paintings. And that happened. And also, people began to do things that other people thought were ironic that were not meant ironically at all. And I use Jeff Koons yes. as the prime instance of that. That what I realized about Jeff as I got to know his work is that he l truly, literally did not know what irony was. And he turned to Martha, my wife, at a dinner party once and said, what is irony? People keep telling me my work is ironic. What is really? irony? Swear to God. And you and got to know you got to know him too. Yeah, I did get personally. To, uh, personally, I did get to know did him. Did you find him irony free? He was irony free. He was totally invested in his imagery, as artists are. He was totally obsessive about his objects. What does he think a giant balloon dog signifies? <laughs> he has a long rap about what it signifies for him. <laughs> and I and it's what gives his work its authority is exactly that he doesn't have ironic distance from what he's making. You know, I think the single most potent object of the 1980s was the bunny that he made. I don't know if any of you remember it, where it's a chrome bunny. It captured something about, it was sort of like Trump Tower in miniature, right? It captured something about that time. And it was, was not a function of a cerebral process on his part. Hmm. It was something much more instinctive. Mm -hmm. And I learned that. And it was a very important lesson to learn, because one of the things I learned is that the way we were trained as art historians, which was to see works of art as sort of pawns in a game of metaphysical historical chess was the worst possible way you could see them. That inevitably, when you got to know artists intimately, yes. you discovered that anything they did, no matter how esoteric or recherche or avant-garde, was inevitably the um, expression of some deep internal urgency. Nothing to do with the culture. In, well, it has to do with the culture because all of our experiences. Not self-consciously not self -consciously commenting so on not culture. Exactly. That would be awful art. Exactly. That would own, that's, that's what we mean by academic art, hmm. is art that takes the culture as its self-conscious subject. Art is made of the exigencies of artists, and it's invariably, when it's interesting, it's made out of conflicting tensions. Hmm. You know, that it's always made not on, out of one vibration, right. but out of two, uh, two vibrations in, in, in conflict. And that was a hugely valuable lesson to learn. That is fascinating. Um, you also write, as you just said, about uh, money. And it, you said there's a problem in art, and it's money, as it always is. Yeah. What happened to the art market and those incredibly inflated prices? How did that change everything? Well, it's, w it's one of those funny things. It, it, money is always the problem with art, and it always was, <laughs> right? It's what people always say. And I remember my, you know, Robert Hughes, who was a, a great influence on me and a, a hugely indignant about it, you know, would write these furious pieces. Can you imagine paying a million dollars for something? Yeah. If that you're seems lucky like a enough, yeah, I was yeah. going to say, you couldn't find a, a mediocre th yeah. fifth-rate Warhol for a million dollars now. You'd, they go for a hundred million. Um, so the question is, what was it about art that, that gave, it that, uh, gave it that value? Right. It became the bullion of our entire culture. Hmm. And, you know, I I if it had gone the other way around, if art were horribly undervalued, yes. we'd be, as it had been sometimes in the 1940s, let's say, everyone would be lecturing and saying, you know, we yeah. undervalue art in our, yes. in our society. And in another way, we, we overvalue it. What's worse for artists? Uh, undervaluing it, I think, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really do. You know, that, that um, <laughs> the, uh, one of the morals of the book, and I hope the book isn't too uh, overinvested with morals, no. is that... Um, it's not. No, I but, <laughs> but one moral of the book is um, art traps time, and that you can't be out of sorts with the art of your own time. I mean, you can because it doesn't stir you, it doesn't speak to your condition, right. and it's one of the reasons I left writing art criticism, but some fundamental vibration of time will always be present in the mm -hmm. period's art, and y y artists don't remake the time, artists register it. Hmm. And tell us about your friendship with uh, the photographer Richard Avedon. Well, Dick Avedon is sort of, if there's a hero in this book, yes. it's, it's, it's Dick Avedon. Um, we, uh, 
coming back to our dear friend Meg Wallace, or Meg's new novel, which should be out uh, in a few months, is all about the experience of a charismatic mentor, you know, mm. a young girl who gets adopted <coughs> by a, a kind of, I shouldn't say this, but a sort of Gloria Steinem-ish yeah. feminist uh, mentor. And I think that's one of the vital experiences that all of us have in life, if we're lucky enough to have it, is somebody in our life who sort of, who sort of shows us the ropes, who, mm -hmm. who, who we admire and who takes us, helps us see the world in new ways. And uh, Dick Avenon, bizarrely, because I'm not a person in the fashion world, was very much that for... And you're for not a photographer. And I'm not a photographer in, at all. Or no, even, you know, visual person in that way was that very much for us. And he was an extraordinary man. He was a man like no other. He came from a remarkable generation. You know, he and Leonard Bernstein were friends. And they, there was a certain generation of American Jews in the 1940s uh, who had sort of arrived and discovered a world of possibility, right? And for whom all of culture, European and, and American, seemed accessible. That mm -hmm. your identity could be completely plural. You could be uh, a wealthy and successful fashion photographer and a serious portrait photographer yes. and six other things, just as Bernstein. Just took it for granted that he could be a Broadway composer and right. the greatest Mahler conductor of his time. And it was a generation with this enormous sense of possibility. And that remained inside them. And they communicated, th and Dick communicated that to us. And it was an extraordinary, it was like having this wonderful tonic, a kind of champagne. Uh, and, it, and it increased our sense of, of possibility. But more important than that, because he was, he was a remarkable man, he showed me that, uh, that there's no substitute for work. Dick worked like a Jewish grocer. Mm -hmm. And I realized that's the way you work when you're an artist. It you wasn't know, just you, genius. No, no, you open the grocery store <laughs> at 8 in the morning, and you work all day, and then you close the grocery store at, at 5 at night. And I thought, right, which is self-evident, but it was, it was important. And then the other thing was is that he showed me that there was no um, uh, pr indissoluble line between life and art. He was someone who loved uh, cooking and music and, yes. and family and, and uh, Thanksgivings, but who also kept strong inside him a kind of iron torch mm -hmm. of uh, purpose and ambition. And uh, uh, I was blessed to have him, and I wanted him to be at the center of this book uh, as a, a kind of... Uh, I don't know how to put this exactly, Ron, as a kind of uh, a, a good Gatsby figure, if you know what I mean. There's, you know, Gatsby in, the, in, in Fitzgerald novel is finally uh, a bit of a fraud, mm -hmm. but he represents that kind of romantic readiness and openness to experience. Mm -hmm. And Dick was no fraud, but for me, he represented that. That's a lovely portrait of him, I really. I'm sorry, he was one And it gets very complex towards the end. Yeah. I won't spoil it, but it's a lovely essay. I tried to write something. I was trying to be truthful about, um, you know, in any book you try and, and insert, even when you're basically a ham like me, you try and insert certain numbers of a uh, certain kind of audacity in mm -hmm. it, or the book won't live, uh, it seems to me. You know, it's always the parts that the reviewers hate are always the good parts <laughs> because they're the parts that nobody, they, people can't identify immediately as <laughs> all along, oh, I know that right. stunt, I know that thing. So for me, the, o the audacities in this book that I, um, I shut my eyes and said, I'm going to go ahead and do this anyway. One was writing about married sex. I'm about to ask oh, you about that. Oh, you're about to ask me about yes. that. So that was, let's say that. Yes. And the other was writing about the experience of uh, a mentor because it can seem sort of awkward, right? It right. seems in that way too. But I thought, no, I'm just going to write about, about. Because you write about <coughs> writing about him and then him reading that essay and not liking it. He doesn't love it. No, no he, d he when I wrote about him, he was upset because not that you'd betrayed him or anything. It was I, I wrote about him in the what I th one of the things you learn as a writer is that everything you think is a bear hug will be perceived as a betrayal and yeah. everything you perceive as a betrayal will be often right. taken as a bear hug. But I you know, when two uh, artists no matter how great the difference in age or two whatever you call us uh, confront each other, they both have an agenda, inevitably. Right. And that was one of the things I was writing You about. captured him in a way he was not used to being captured. He's you used to do being the capture. He was used to being the capture, and of course, he whenever he would awkward. do a portrait and people say, oh, I don't look that, he'd say, how can they protest, yes. right? But then he didn't care for the reverse. Yeah, it's a very complicated <laughs> thing you, you outlined there. Let's talk about marriage. You've been married a long time, very happily. I've been married. Uh, Martha makes me swear I will not say this, but it's in the book. I've been married <laughs> for uh, 37 years. Wow, that's great. Yeah. You got married early. We got married very young. When you're told together. not to get married. We were told, uh, Martha's mother did everything except throw herself <laughs> across the Unitarian preacher to keep it from happening. Yeah. And now that I'm a parent myself, and my son is the age that we were when we right. got married, I would no more allow him to exactly. be married. Some schnook who he right. hardly <laughs> then. 
Are you kidding? If he came to me now and said, Dad, we're thinking of getting, he has a lovely girlfriend. They live in Baltimore for the summer, not far from here. Uh, didn't come tonight, you notice? Um, he, uh, <laughs> he may be here. He may be here. He's working as a bartender in Baltimore. Um, <coughs> he said, you know, Zoe and I are thinking of getting married. I said, babe, that's a huge mistake. You're <laughs> way too young. Don't do that. But we got married, and, I, and, and we've managed, you know. Yeah. What is the secret to a long and happy marriage? In the book I wrote about Darwin uh, and Lincoln. Uh, <laughs> that is not the secret. But I said there are three things that you need in a long and happy marriage, uh, because Darwin had one. Uh, uh, lust, laughter, and loyalty, the three L's. And you need all three operating at the same time, because the overwhelming uh, urge in a long marriage is, is that everything slides towards loyalty, right? <laughs> and you basically are engaged in exercise and loyalty. <laughs> lust and laughter have been long lost. The key, if you want, I should write a self-help book about yes. this. Those <laughs> really sell, yes, you know. I, yeah, <laughs> tell me about it. Um, uh, this could be called the 20 minutes or something, not the 10,000 hours. That you can, is that you can't get back to lust without going through laughter. In mm -hmm. other words, the, when, you know, it's always a disaster when, some, when you're, your marriage is failing, you say, we'll go off for a romantic weekend, never works, right? Because you can't go from loyalty to lust. But if you can get back to laughter, then <laughs> lust can be in the adjoining room. But the other thing is, as I say in the book, is that one of the things you learn is that sex goes on being good. And the other audacity in the book, as I say, as I write about married sex, is that, um, which no one wants you to write about at right. all. People, you can write adultery. You can't right. write enough books about right. adultery, right? Uh, <laughs> you can't write enough prose about uh, illicit sex. You yes. can't write enough prose about um, underage sex. You, yep. you can, but married sex, though it's the prime form that exists, can't yeah. write about it. It's yeah. embarrassing for people. But <laughs> one of the things I say in it is that you reach a certain point in the marriage, right, no matter how happily mated you are, where you are no longer enacting sex, you are reenacting it. You're exactly like those Civil War reenactors, you see, <laughs> on the weekends, because you know Stick with us, because you know exactly what everyone will be wearing. You know the costumes. Oh, oh, you have it. Here. Oh, you have it. Here. So that the couple, yeah, eventually start to reenact. So the couple become a bit like the Civil War reenactors, the one who put on blue and gray uniforms and fire disarmed old rifles. <laughs> that they know the actions, the uniforms, the climax, and the casualties perfectly well before they start the excitement. Doesn't diminish the pleasure they take in the exercise. The pleasure of long married sex, like that of a scripted reenactment of Gettysburg's lies in the combination of furious action and complete predictability. <laughs> and I think that's, I thank you, Ron, because that was the, I, when I wrote that, I thought, can I, can I, am I really going to publish that? <laughs> and, and then I thought, yeah, I mean, why not? I mean, it's... it's so Martha hasn't read this yet. <laughs> uh, I've tried to cover it up. She read it, and she had mixed feelings about it when, I, when she read it. But I said she was clearly being cast in the conquering role. She's, <laughs> she's the Union troops, and I'm <laughs> the Confederates doing, uh, you know, Pickering's charge there. In the it's not Pickering. What's his name? Uh, Pickett. Pickett. Thank These you. people know that. Pickett's charge. Yeah. <coughs> well, we're not going to do better than that tonight, folks. Uh, <laughs> you want to take some questions? Sure. Okay. Love to. There's a mic here and here. Uh, please come up. Make your question brief and make it a question, not a statement. And please, I apologize again that I can't stay in and, and personalize books. I am on this insane schedule. We call it the cattle cars of Knopf, right? They send you out. They look for, you know, the 1 a.m. flight that they can put you on, you know, that where you fly your own plane to get to the next place. So that is the only reason I, I am not staying. So I read a brilliant article you wrote in The New Yorker 10 years ago, and I've been looking for it ever since, and it was a pay into wine and how much you loved wine. Can you tell me what the title was so I can find oh, it? Oh, it's actually, you know what? You can purchase it because it's a chapter. I made it into a chapter in my book about eating. The table comes first. And, and okay, so what's the title of the wine article? Uh, I, you know, I, uh, I, I no longer remember what the title was in the but New Yorker. If York I look at the if table, you look in the table of contents, you'll see it's there's a whole you. chapter about wine. Thank you, though, and Good. easy to purchase. <laughs> yes. This is embarrassing because this is a segue. So I read an article about Olivia. Yes, my daughter. And I've been trying to find it forever, and so where do I find it, and how's she doing? Wh which one, which piece? Was this about the, her imaginary friend? Or right, her right. Charlie Ravioli. My daughter Olivia, when she was three, had an imaginary friend who was always too busy to play with her because she was growing up in New York and all she knew were interrupted connections. Olivia is great. She's 17 years old. She's getting ready to apply to college. Um, she ha wears an extremely one-sided smile when anyone asks her, how's Charlie Ravioli? Because she ceased being interested in Charlie Ravioli 15 years ago. Um, <laughs> 
But she's, she's great. She's a wonderful writer, hugely smart, imaginative kid who spent the summer working for an uh, amazing thing called Green Mantle, Neil Ferguson's uh, consulting firm. And I uh, couldn't be prouder of her. And that story is in another book of mine on sale here as well called <laughs> Through the Children's Gate is, w is where that story is. I was wondering when you l were living in this little apartment and you came home and saw all these mice, um, but then you say you're, you and your wife looked at each other and realized later when you got the job that you could stay in New York. A lot of, for a lot of people, that would send them running mm -hmm. for the hills. What made you want to stay? Well, in the little, in the tiny apartment, which we called the Blue Room after the Rogers and Hart song, it was uh, cockroaches rather than mice that, w that visited us every night. We, we were so dumb and young and ingenuous and naive and in love that we just thought, oh, that's just what New York is like, right? You know, we had no idea that we were living in a place that was suffering from an infestation of vermin. We just, we didn't, we weren't smart enough. And we wanted to be in New York. We wanted to be where life was happening. You know, we wanted the oldest, you know, it, you know Lost Illusions, Balzac's great novel, captures that. You know, you, people come from the provinces. Yeah. My Canadian friends will hate me for calling Canada the provinces. <laughs> But uh, to the to the big town, and you want to find out what the big town is like. It's as simple as that. Okay. Uh, going back to Paris and the Moon, I don't know if I guess I <laughs> always wondered. Do you know what happened to Cressida? Oh yes, the little this in in the story. Which actually, if I had to pick, you know, they sometimes do those anthologies. You know, this is my best or something. The story you're referring to, which is called Angels Dining at the mm -hmm. Ritz, mm -hmm. which is sort of the last story in Paris of the Moon, is my favorite of anything I've ever written. Um, and uh, most complicated in the sense that it has a, a kind of charming surface, I think, about seven-year-olds, but it's but actually a dark story about absolutely. love, pain, <laughs> and punishment. Uh, and uh, that little girl, Cressida, her real name was Victoria, Victoria okay. Metzger, and we, uh, Luke reunited with her in Paris about two summers ago. And they didn't exactly date, but they had, they're still friends, they're Facebook friends, and she's doing splendidly. She's in school now in, uh, she just graduated uh, from, uh, not LSC, but from a school in, in, uh, in Great Britain. Mm -hmm. So she's doing great, she's doing great. Okay, uh, that she's sort of story has always stuck with me, particularly the bit where the bill comes, the bill yeah, from the, the hot comes, chocolate, for all the hot chocolate. Uh, all the, the hot chocolate, and you go to your wife, but it's Cressida. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you. I'm glad you like that story. It's one of the ones that I never published it in the New Yorker. Mm -hmm. Curiously, because I was trying to keep it back for the book, mm -hmm. because it was one of those ones. I have brilliant editors, and I love them dearly. But it was one of the ones I wanted to come out exactly the way I, w I didn't want anybody else's fingerprints on that story. So I, not that they put their fingerprints on it, but inevitably, <laughs> editors are paid to have ideas about other people's <laughs> writing. Um, can you tell us about your morning routine? What you read? What you write first thing in the morning? Sure. I. I I f oddly enough, I just did a food diary for New York Magazine to, to about this. I get up uh, early with our little dog, Butterscotch, whom I've written about, and uh, who's desperate for breakfast. My wife, as I say, lives on insanely strong coffee. It's about a half pound of coffee and a half cup of water <laughs> is her formula. <laughs> and I make coffee, mm -hmm. and I do what everybody does, right? You know, I make the rounds of my email from overnight and, uh, you know, read the horror stories of the day on the Washington Post website. And, uh, Times website, and uh, then I try and get to work at about 8.30 or so, 8.39, and I write for four hours, four hours straight. And the one piece of advice I would give to everybody who's sort of starting out to be a writer or becoming a writer is that if you can do four hours a day, you're golden. It's sort of unrealistic to try and do more than four hours, but you have four hours of really strong energy in you at that, at that moment. And if uh, my sister, I have many sisters, I have six sisters, and one of them is a psychologist, five sisters, I beg your pardon, and one of them is a psychologist, there's six of us, and she says absolutely that studies show, science shows that four hours is the outer limit of creative work. You can do sort of clerical work beyond that, but you can't do creative work. And so do, I do my four hours, and then I go to the gym, and then I shop for dinner. I love to cook, and I cook every night pretty much. Um, for the for the family, so that's my day. It is the most boring day. I have one day, <laughs> and it never varies. I, you you will find me at those three places: my desk, the gym, uh, the Whole Foods, in the kitchen, uh, every day. Uh, by the way, your sister was my professor um, at, at Berkeley. Berkeley. Oh yeah, wow! So yes. Well, you know she's <laughs> yes, she so speaks she with great. authority and yeah. a very good writer too. <laughs> Has a very good book called um, The Gardener and the Carpenter that you can read about children. Someone else. I'm. <laughs> 
a very different sort of question than what you've been getting. Um, I, I'm interested in the word romantic and the various ways that we use that word. It seems that you lived a very romantic life in, uh, in the 80s in New York, and that's what the book's about. And it, in my mind, it would be considered romantic whether you were there as a young married uh, couple or not, just making go of it in, in New York, in a city like New York when you're, when you're young is kind of a romantic thing to do. So why, why is it? What's the basis for use of the word in that context as well as the other kind of the more usual context or other contexts that we uh, use oddly, romantic? Oddly enough, I just earlier in the summer gave a lecture on that very subject, romance and romanticism. Is it in print? No, it's not in print, though you may be able to find it online because it, it was in an interesting context. The Orchestra of St. Luke's, which is a wonderful kind of chamber orchestra in New York, asked me if I would do a program where they would play Schubert's Octet, which is a great work of romantic music, and I would speak in the interstices of the movement because I'm a great... Yeah, I'm a lover of Schubert, and I thought, this is the single dumbest thing I've ever done once I agreed to do it, because it's Schubert versus Gopnik, and it's quite clear who's going to win that, <laughs> that battle. But it was such an intriguing idea, and I love the company of musicians more than anyone else. You know, they're, they're, they are a superior race of people, and the idea of spending a month just working with musicians and watching how they learn the Schubert octet and having something to write in between was just irresistible for me. So we did this program together. And one of the things I talked about was the relationship between romanticism in the sense that we associate with Schubert or uh, Schumann or uh, Goethe or whomever, <coughs> and romance. Because of course, the romanticism of uh, Schubert is essentially dark. It's about all of the repressed parts of human experience, right? It's all about uh, the sublime, the terrifying. It's death and the maiden. It's the, 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 the what's his name, Meryl Cunning, uh, racing away. It's Vinterizer, right, where the poor lover is thrown out into the snow and goes stumbling through while birds throw snowballs at him. It's, that's what romanticism means as a, as a big movement. But we also use it to mean our uh, intimate and erotic feelings about other people. And I said, and I told the story, because it's a true story, that um, the very first date I ever took Marfa on was to hear Dietrich Fischer Dieskau. I was taught to how to pronounce his name. Um, the great uh, German leader singer sing Schubert's Winterreise. And my theory was now that this was, yes? That was your first date. Our <laughs> first date. She had so little interest in me, she <laughs> would not go out with me. She hated my name, for one thing. And her mother was not crazy about me. And I, th I was the only card I had to play. I thought she would be interested in this. She was. <laughs> and exactly the place where romanticism connects with romance is that what romanticism is all about is the irretrievably irrational nature of life. And that's where it touch that's where the two things connect, it seems to me. That there's about human, tr human attraction is profoundly irrational and will never be rationalized. What makes the chemistry between a man and a woman, or a woman and a woman, or a man and a man is just too mysterious. And we always go away from dinner parties saying, what do they see in each other, right? <laughs> but we do. And Romanticism as a movement, as a big movement in sensibility and in the arts, gave us all the license to recognize that there was, after the age of reason, that there are certain aspects of life that are forever profoundly unreasonable, and that we need not to try and rationalize those moments, but we need to respect them and understand them. And that's very much part of what big romanticism is about, and it's one of the gifts that it gives to the small romanticism of people. So that was the lecture I gave. On that, on that subject um, a, a month ago. A great vision to answer. That was great, thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask about something you've, you've touched upon in this talk, this audacity aspect. Right. And as a 27 years aspiring writer, so hoping to get those 10,000 <laughs> hours soon, um, I always think that the grittiness, the stuff that you were talking about that makes real art, the tension, all this stuff, comes from these very private, personal moments that involve other human beings. And I was curious how you decide that's always been fascinating to me. Lena Dunn talks about everything. You right. talk about maybe some things. How, do, how does one or how do you decide uh, what's the line for you? What, what can you say? What can you not say? What hurts? And I remember even Elizabeth Gilbert said, I, I, I made a lot of mistakes in one book. And right. so this one, she, you could tell she's dancing around it right. a little bit more and yeah. didn't want to hurt feelings, you know? And, do, so. do you know, and I, say this, I say this to praise her, not to use her name, not to right. exploit her name. But Liz Gilbert, who I know slightly, 
because we were both at GQ. We both were right. She wrote for <laughs> GQ back at the back in the day. Um, was one of the people who really encouraged me to write this book. And I said, nobody really wants to hear about like a long marriage. She said, no, people really do want to hear right. about that. They're actually right. interested in that. Um, and uh, and she was right because she has the gift of self-dramatization in the positive sense, mm -hmm. right? Seems to me when you're doing the kind of nonfiction memoir writing that I do, it tends to shade in one of two directions. It can shade in the direction of fiction. I don't mean of falsity, but I mean in the direction of the novel storytelling. Mary Carr, for instance, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, her Liars Club could be a novel. It's not a novel. It's a true story. But it's shaped like a novel. It has the presence of a novel. Or you can bend it in the direction of the essay, which is what I do, right? So that Mary adds a note of, uh, Mary Carr adds a note of uh, drama to everything she writes. And I add a note of reflection sort of to everything that I write. And I think those are two different ways you can imagine. You know, the truth is, is that the you know, writers can't win because it doesn't help if you write fiction, right? Philip Roth writes nothing but fiction, to name our greatest writer. And it infuriates all the people who right. know him, you know, and, and or, or grew up with him. You know, you don't win by writing fiction. Uh, my f account of it is, to myself, is, is that writing is many things, but one of the crucial things is it's about making private life public. And the gift of making private life public is that we all discover the things that embarrass us, that shame us, that bother us, that, w that are undignified in our own lives are exactly the common uh, parlance of, of the world, right? That everybody feels embarrassed, undignified, failed, unhappy, uh, awkward. <coughs> and so <coughs> by making private life public in that way, you actually are serving your readers. You're serving, you're serving the world. It, cruelty is cruelty. You have the same, what I always say about this is that you have exactly the same sense of moral obligations when you're writing a talk of the town story about somebody who's a slack rope walker living on a boat, which I did once. That is, you want to describe them as accurately as you can. You don't want to humiliate them in any way. You don't want to betray their confidence. You want to treat them with the respect that a human being deserves, but at the same time, you don't want to sugarcoat them. You want to actually show them as you perceive them. That's an insanely complicated moral transaction. There's no simplifying it, and it's true if I'm writing later on the airplane about our conversation tonight, or if I'm writing about my wife or children or anyone else. And there's just, that's the moral transaction in which literature takes place, and it's treacherous, it's difficult, right. it's painful. But at the core, you say to yourself, if we don't make private life public, then all of us remain locked in our own terrors. And think of how grateful you are to a Mary Carr, right? for telling you everybody's life is crazy, mm -hmm. right? You have no idea how crazy my life is, and I came out of it eloquent and, and, and stirred. I, I think that's the work literature does for us in any genre, and that uh, we are so grateful for that, that we're willing to continually walk into the, the many traps it, it, it offers us. So my words, to, to end a very long and, and uh, boring answer is, as Jesus said, be not afraid. Be not afraid. That's the best advice anybody ever gave anybody is be not afraid. Yeah. And I think <laughs> that's... We're, that's we're very grateful to you for thank coming you. tonight. It's been very well, wonderful. Thank you. Charming. Thank you much. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, um, thank you all.